everybody. Welcome. Welcome to this uh, series of uh, um, conversations that we are going to have the EGI webinar for 2022. Uh, so I'm certainly very excited to be the first person to start it. Um, and I hope it's interesting enough for you and I can give you some information today that uh, you will like. So I'm Priyasma and Ian has already um, introduced me. Um, so I'm working in scientific computing and IT services as a data expert uh, in ETH Zurich. Um, and I I'm the project manager for the OpenRDM.eu um, project that we currently have. So who is uh, basically the scientific IT services? I would like to just give you a quick introduction of us and what we do in ATH Zurich. Um, we are a section of the ATH Zurich IT services, and we are about uh, a little over 40 experts in various areas of scientific computing. Uh, we have background in different areas of science, as you can see, it could range from high performance computing We have different projects in data science and machine learning. Uh, we have uh, research data management. Uh, this program is a part of this. Uh, we have confidential research data. We have consulting and training and, of course, scientific computing and data analysis and so on. Um, Um, I would like to also give you a quick introduction to the EDI ACE uh, part of, and how we are uh, we are interested or how we actually got involved in this. As you know, the DCI ACE program is empowering researchers from all disciplines to collaborate in data and compute intensive research across borders. And that's why we are from Switzerland. We are um, and we are interested. We were interested in this, and we became a part of this uh, program through funding. Um, and um, the AGIAs has been building on the distributed computing integration in EOS Cup. It's been delivering the EOS Compute Platform um, and contributing to the EOS Data Commons through a federation of compute, uh, cloud compute and storage facilities, along with analytical tools and federated access services. Uh, the platform is built on the EGI Federation and it's one of the largest distributed computing infrastructure for um, research. Um, and then for openrdm.eu, so we are basically, this is a program which is based around the ARDM platform OpenBIS. ARDM is Active Research Data Management. Um, OpenBIS is developed for the last 12 years by the scientific IT services of the Informatic Dienste at ETH Zurich. And openrdm.eu is now basically an active project for us and we have added this as a resource uh, where Enhance R is a provider in the EOSC uh, marketplace. Um, because I mentioned Enhance R, maybe it's the right time to also mention who they are. Um, Enhance R is a nationally and internationally recognized network for Swiss research IT expertise, and we are uh, being hosted by Enhance R as a provider in EOSC. Um, the goal of Enhance R is to facilitate research excellence in Switzerland by federating research IT specialist, specialist groups at various academic institutions, sharing expertise and resources in the scientific community. Uh, there are quite a few members, uh, as you can see, and it builds on the foundation of the Swiss National Grid Association um, and continues its roles and mandates and sustains the research IT cooperation developed in the Swiss Universities Enhance Our Project. They are also a member of the EGI and the SATW. Okay, so I think that should cover the quick round of introduction of who we are and how we sort of uh, came into uh, this whole program. Um, now, before um, I move on to the um, to the actual presentation, I just wanted to mention that this um, presentation, uh, this this project of OpenRDM.eu, is um, something that a few of us are actively working together. So, um, so some of the things that I'm actually going to talk about today um, are things that we actively use. But my colleagues, um, Katerina Barillari, Henry Lutke, uh, Richard uh, Wattenberger, and Sergio Mafioletti, all of these colleagues of mine are very actively involved in this project along with me. Okay, so um, so I have mentioned about the research data management platform already about OpenBIS. So before we move into that, we must mention why this is even relevant, right? So the research workflow in experimental and computational labs kind of looks like this at the moment. 
is you can see that you know you can collect data from all different sources you can have samples metadata and then we go to instruments where you can you know do some um, measuring of some some samples some things that you're working with and you can also collect data from different other external sources as well and finally you get, gather all this data together along with metadata um, and then um, the next step is usually processing of this data so in every step of this way as you continue with the research workflow um, you generate a lot of data so again once you process this data you get process data along with some metadata and the next step is usually where uh, the researchers do data analysis and once you do the data analysis again you have some more output data along with metadata and finally when you're ready to actually publish this data only a little bit of this data goes into publications right in most cases the other parts of data just either get lost or you probably uh, just pass it on to somebody else in case they're interested in, in, in working in the same area of research. But that's that's very rare. OK, so um, so one of the things that uh, that has been um, a topic of discussion for a very long time is that nowadays researchers are obviously generating a lot of this data and what happens to all this data. So. Um, the fair uh, guiding principles came into existence because of some of these kind of discussions originally or concerns and the fair data principles basically mean uh, that the data should be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Um, the funding agencies and journals um, are becoming increasingly demanding that the data is published according to fair data principles. Um, like I said, there's a lot of data that is getting generated during a research project. Um, and then there is this problem of data drowning, right? Because we are not going to obviously publish all of this data or in a lot of cases, people, like I said, they, they just forget about this data. And um, that's why appropriate data and information management right from the beginning of a research project could be very useful. It could be very beneficial. And of course, avoid this problem of data drowning. So this is an example of the data spread. This is a common scenario at ETH Zurich, but I'm pretty sure that this could be potentially the case in a lot of other um, um, research places as well. So as you see, some of our researchers, you know, they are working with, uh, let's say, protocols, SOPs and so on. They have the material samples. Some of them have codes. Um, then there is process data, there is raw data and all kinds of stuff. They have analysis notebooks. Some people also prefer to use um, hand notebooks, right? Like you scribble notes, and you have post-its and whatnot. Um, and we have different places of storage, of course, a local hard drive, then you have, we have our NAS, uh, we have CDS, LTS, which are tapes, long-term storage tapes, we have the cluster, we have the cloud solutions and so on. So you are storing all this information, you know, when you're working in a lab in different places, or it's not even about working in a lab, it could also be an office or wherever you are working in today's world, we are always constantly dealing with data. And a lot of times we end up so storing this data in different places. So this could be a problem because the data is now spread in different places, including the fact that you have handwritten notes or, you know, notebooks and, and post-its and whatnot. So the ideal scenario, of course, would be a combined ELN lean sort of an approach uh, where you have an electronic lab notebook along with uh, laboratory information management system or LIMS, right? So where you can have everything together in one central place, one central location. Um, and this is how or why OpenBIS came into existence and we propose OpenBIS as a solution in this case, which is which will provide you a combined um, sort of solution, a combined approach of the ELN along with LIMS. Um, so like I said, so OpenBIS is a complete um, solution for fair data management. So OpenBIS essentially could have, I, I would say it has three major components. Um, the electronic lab notebook, the inventory management, and part of the data management associated with it. Um, so when we talk about the inventory management, essentially this is the part where we have the samples, materials, reagents, SOPs that you know you as a researcher might be using. Um, and you need to manage these effectively so that not just your day-to-day -day work can get easier, but also a long-term plan for you in terms of eventually when you are going to actually start writing this down for a publication or long-term storage of this information for other researchers or collaborators in the lab. This could also be very beneficial that way. Um, 
the electronic lab notebook is a place where you can actually write down the description of the experiments, uh, description of the processes, and also the data analysis that you you know you are doing during your research time, um, and and the data management aspect of it. So you have to store this data that you are you are generating during your research time, and this should be connected to your experimental description in some way. So for all of this, OpenBIS is um, OpenBIS has a fairly good uh, solution for you to to um, to be able to have a nice way of storing your data. So I will come into some um, features of OpenBIS. So I'd like to talk a little bit about OpenBIS in a nutshell. Um, like I said, OpenBIS is our proposed solution for research labs for collaborative work. Um, so as you can see in this case, um, OpenBIS is actually a client server application. So ideally, um, you know, the best potential use of OpenBIS comes forward when you use it as a lab together or you, some people are using it together to, you know, this, this enhances a collaborative approach. I mean, of course, you can download it on your own laptop and use it just by yourself, but this does not bring out the most value of OpenBIS because, it's a, because like I was saying, it, it, um, it is supposed to to um, to really help in, in collaborative work because a lot of people could come in together and put all kinds of information together um, um, potentially for uh, for the research data management to have a better approach. So in this case, um, OpenBIS uh, is hosted in a in a server uh, is a client server application and it's hosted on a server and the user can actually access it through um, a user interface. Um, <clears throat> there is a samples uh, management component of OpenBIS, which I just mentioned about uh, before. So what this means is um, the inventory section, which I kind of mentioned before, the inventory is sort of the samples management aspect of OpenBIS. So the wet lab research researchers especially, they usually have a lot of samples that they need to keep an inventory of. Um, and then we have, um, these, um, this is a life science version of OpenBIS basically that we are showing you, but you should remember that OpenBIS is highly customizable. So it doesn't matter that, you know, what branch of um, quantitative sciences you are in. Um, the collections that I am showing here currently, the, the materials uh, part here actually shows some collections, some predefined collections like chemicals, plasmids, and so on. This is specifically for life sciences, but it could be anything. It could range from anything like, for example, soil samples, or plastics, polymers, or whatever it is that you're working on. And I will show you some examples later where you will see um, how very customizable um, OpenBiz is. So no matter what it is, whatever science you are doing, these are just collections, just ways to organize your, your samples. So whatever it is that your starting materials are. So that's what it is meant by sample management. Um, next, there is a there's a section for protocols management, and uh, this is the these are the steps that you use as a researcher, right? So you have protocols, you have general protocols. And some people have I don't know they can do um, um, they have different kinds of steps that they need to use uh, when you are actually performing an experiment. So all of these descriptions could actually go in your protocols. And as you see here, there is some description, uh, and then these are called there's something called parents and what parents means is all these different uh, let's say regions that you're actually using during uh, working um, or using your protocol you can actually list them here so I will talk about parents and child this is a particular term that is um, that is specific to OpenBiz a little bit after but uh, just so you know that open in OpenBiz there is a way to form connections so you can basically connect everything that you are using your samples your materials and so on um, and you can make connections meaning Meaning um, nothing gets basically lost in the process of your of your research work. So there is always a way for you to make connections and find things that you have used or how you are using it in the following subsequent steps and so on. So the next part is the ELN. Um, so the ELN is the electronic lab notebook. Um, and here, as you can see, like I mentioned, so the inventory part is what I showed you. The samples management and the protocols management part is within the inventory. And next you have the lab notebook part. So the lab notebook is somewhere where you come in and start to basically put in your experiments, a description of your experiments. So every individual will have their own private space. So you get a personal folder. 
Um, and then within these personal folders, you can start to build your projects. Within projects, you can have experiments. You can have several experiments within a project. And every experiment, within every experiment, you can have different experimental steps. Um, here also you have the same um, option of parents, which I mentioned before. So this process of linking entities together. Um, <clears throat> And ultimately, when um, the the really nice feature uh, of uh, the, the really nice idea of this parents um, and child relationship that that I was trying to convey you about this linking of entities is, you can see this kind of a hierarchy graph. So what this means is, like I said, everything that you have used along your way. So this workflow that you're actually doing, you can make connections, right? Like all the um, chemicals that you have used, all the samples, the protocols that you used um, in a particular experimental step, you can get, get this sort of, um, this whole overview from this hierarchy graph that is possible that you can create in OpenBIS. And this has particularly been very, very useful for a lot of um, researchers. Uh, for example, uh, also simply because, you know, some people work with plasmids, maybe, you know, when you work with uh, a lot of plasmids, maybe you want to check in one of the previous batches of, of plasmid, maybe there was, uh, was a particular mutation that you're interested in and so on. So you can always go backtracking or look into things even after, I don't know, one year of research that, that has already been done. So another important aspect of OpenBIS is the data management part. So of course, the data uh, that you are bringing in in OpenBIS, um, um, the data ingestion into OpenBIS actually happens uh, in th in three different ways. So one could be the via the web interface. So the web interface would mean when inside an OpenBIS, uh, there is a upload button, um, and you can just basically click this upload button and attach the data file. Um, and there is also the option of using PyBIS, which is a programmatic approach, of course, uh, but both these two um, data ingestion steps are really helpful when you have data which is not super big and super, super large data, so meaning more or less the data should be within uh, or less than 10 GB. Um, anything higher than that, we would recommend the third uh, method, which is our Dropbox mechanism. The Dropbox actually has nothing to do with the commercial Dropbox program, it's just a name. Uh, in this case, the Dropbox is the folder where the data is moved. And then once the data is moved from here, it will go to, to OpenBIS. And then in OpenBIS, this data will be attached to an experimental step. So, um, and then you can basically see all these data sets that um, get, um, get attached to your experimental step. Um, we also have the big data link. So the big data link is actually a command line tool, and this actually allows the OpenBIS uh, to to uh, to be used as a metadata repository. So this is only, uh, you know, uh, this this link is useful only in cases where you don't want you have large data and you potentially don't want to move this data around and not store it in OpenBIS. However, you would like OpenBIS to have some form of a crosstalk and then you don't have to you know move everything. This is very helpful with large collaborations and when there's a lot of people involved maybe in different other places and you don't want to move data around. Uh, this tool needs to be installed where the, where the data is uh, located. And as you can see that it will create a new um, folder in, in OpenBIS with, um, with uh, these um, files. And then you can basically use SSH to actually connect to the server and, uh, <clears throat> and um, access the files in the, um, in the server. Um, in terms of data analysis, OpenBIS directly does not perform any data analysis, right? Like OpenBIS is uh, is um, really um, it has the major components of OpenBIS is the inventory and the lab notebook component. Having said that, we do have a lot of uh, let's say computationally more inclined researchers who also use OpenBIS. So we have brought in um, the MATLAB and Jupyter Lab components to OpenBIS. So of course, this facilitates data analysis. Um, in this case, we have a Jupyter Hub server, which can be connected to OpenBIS and uh, can 
just uh, you know invoke um, the Jupyter notebook and you probably some of you might know how the Jupyter notebook looks like this is how it looks like um, this basically has some code and you know you can run some codes you can use the data sets that you have stored in um, OpenBIS run some analysis and the output could also again be stored in OpenBIS so this is how the as you see this is the analyzed data the raw data has been used you have some analyzed data and you have uh, these are Python notebooks. These have been stored again um, in OpenBIS. So, um, so this functionality is also available. So, for some of you who might be interested in, you know, in running some codes, you can use Jupyter uh, um, as a form to do that, or even MATLAB, whichever the case is easier for you. Um, these are the links to the local Jupyter installation, and this is the link for our MATLAB installation. Now, our colleague um, Henry Lutke has particularly actually worked on the MATLAB um, um, link, and so if you have any more questions around that, he's also here today, I believe. I'm not sure. I think he, sh he should be here, so you can also ask him afterwards. Um, and lastly, there are the options of APIs. Uh, so. Um, APIs are actually application programming interfaces, and so in case of OpenBIS, also we have uh, made the uh, we have we have uh, the option of um, of using different APIs, um, and uh, for again for programmatically um, uh, inclined researchers, this is definitely an option, and you can also um, use OpenBIS uh, like this. If you don't prefer to use the standard interface, there's always ways to write your own API or use some of the existing ones modify them or, or and so on so it's it's all out there and this is an open source software so of course you know you can you can do some of these things on your own if you want to with the additional open piece features that i would like to mention i've already quickly mentioned about the relationships part uh, there is also the option to import and export. Some people always ask, what if I leave the lab or, you know, I'm going to go to another place and start setting things up and how do I take my data? And yes, this is, of course, possible. Just as you can import data, you can export all of your content that you have in OpenBIS in four different formats. So this is possible. Uh, there is also the, the component of user rights management. So what that basically means is we were mentioning about the, the collaborative aspect, right? So you can have different people working on one particular project and you might not want essentially all of them to have the same level of, of rights. So some people, maybe for some people, you just want them to be um, people who just read things. And in case of others, they might be may might be more relevant, and you might want them to be admins who can make more changes, you know, read, write, edit, delete, or so on. So there are all kinds of options like this to play around with the roles. So this option is, is also very useful for a lot of different uh, research areas. Um, there is an audit trail, meaning things that are getting deleted um, or things that that things that are getting um, um, edited. There is a way for for us for you to go to the the databases and everything is stored in also through the user interface you can actually look into the the audit uh, or the, the trail of changes not the audit the trail of changes um, there's this aspect of data immutability so what that basically means is um, in once the data is an open base you cannot uh, make changes to the data sets so um, meaning you cannot keep editing a data set. Uh, you, we don't have a version system essentially. So you cannot just edit a data set and, and it will be saved automatically. You know, it doesn't work like that. So if you need to make a change, then you need to um, make the change outside of OpenBase and um, upload this new uh, data set. Um, there's a sample storage manager. Um, this is very useful for um, for people who have uh, samples, uh, wet lab samples. Um, this is also something that some people like to explore for arranging their refrigerators or I don't know the nitrogen tanks and so on. Um, um, this has particularly been helpful for those kind of researches. And there is a barcode reader. So you, if you have samples where you would like to put barcodes, you can generate your barcodes from OpenBase. Also, you can use existing barcodes and link them to your uh, to your samples. So this is also possible. 
Other than this, we have an integration with data repositories possible. At the moment, it's only Zenodo and the ETH Zurich Research Collection. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this again, some researchers find it useful, particularly because you know if you have data that you are ready to publish or you have already published, then you can use these repositories directly where you can put um, all this information. Okay, so this brings me a little bit now again to the OpenRDM uh, part of our project. So I've already described quite a bit about OpenBase because like I said, this program is based around the OpenBase. Uh, um, 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 and then in this case, what we did was essentially for this project, we have installed and configured a preview open base server on a cloud infrastructure. So this cloud based preview instance has no data backup nor retention. Um, and we are also consulting and supporting for on premise or and or um, own cloud based deployment of open base. So the user support would include data model generation. So what data model basically means is when you uh, you as a researcher, when when you think in the beginning of how you're going to um, organize your data, you need to find a way how best you can organize all of this, how you want to put in, uh, you know, let's say your projects, or maybe it's better in your case to not just work on projects, but maybe it could be a user based, uh, let's say organization of your data and so on. Maybe it could be a diseased, uh, it could be a disease that you're working on, right? Maybe there are different projects where people work specifically on diseases. So maybe it makes sense to organize your entire data based on a project which is named after a disease and so on. So it just, it's just a way of how you want to organize this data. It could be something simple, but it could also be something complex, so we would support uh, in this um, uh, in this uh, data model generation, and we also help in importing data into OpenBase. And uh, there is training for the use of OpenBase as a data management platform as well. So, like I said, uh, this project obviously has been funded by EGIA in the Horizon 2020 Research and Innovative Program Framework. Um, we are doing training and best effort user support along with the self-hosted OpenBiz, and we have currently quite a few uh, customers who are researchers who are actually using uh, this project and we are very happy that we have been able to, um, to actively help quite a few of them. Um, so that sort of wraps up my conversation around openrdm.eu and I'm going to go to the example use cases. So before I go to the use cases, does anybody have a question at this moment or anything that they would like to um, ask? Maybe what we can do is if you want to pose the questions in the chat, this is also okay for me and we can always come back to the questions afterwards towards the end once we finish with the presentation. Is this okay, Yin? Yes, I think that's the best. Yeah, okay. And then we can open the floor for everybody to sort of discuss because right now I think with the webinar, I, other people cannot, the attendees cannot talk, right? Mm. Okay. Yeah, they can post, uh, post the question in the Q&A session and then we can come back. Okay, great. Um, so then um, I think I'm going to move on to the use cases. Um, so, so my first use case is, um, about the Bedretta project, and this is a project that is currently ongoing in um, ETH. Uh, this is an, this is a project from ETH Zurich, so um, which is using OpenBase actually. And why I wanted to give this example is because you have to remember that with the OpenRDM.eu, the projects that are under this umbrella, in most cases we don't uh, uh, we don't have access to their instances, right? So these are people who are either using our service, our consulting effort, or we are uh, uh, you know we, with the, some people can also use our our demo or our preview instance, but we are not uh, directly having uh, you know access to their instances. So this it's easier for me to showcase. An example where I have actual access. So um, the Bedretta project is an internal project. We have uh, permission to actually talk about it. This is a Swiss energy project. And in this uh, case, uh, the researchers, what they were trying to do is to study techniques and procedures for a safe, efficient, um, and sustainable use of the geothermal heat. Um, and um, there is some, there's a place called, uh, there's a tunnel called Bedretto Tunnel, which is actually connecting Ticino with the Fuca Tunnel and several boreholes have been drilled there and there's some sensors which have been placed in the boreholes and data is getting connected, uh, collected from these sensors and they get stored in OpenBase. 
And this lab notebook uh, is um, basically, like I was mentioning before, that there are different ways to organize your data. In this case, as you can see, that the lab notebook has been organized by projects rather than by users. But this is also possible. Like I mentioned, every person in a lab notebook can get their own user space, or you can also consider, um, you know, organizing them by projects, as is the case in this uh, in this uh, example. And then in, in this uh, project, they currently actually don't even use the inventory. So again, like I wanted to mention that this is also possible. If you don't want to use the inventory, that's fine. In one of the projects, we have a biobanking project. And for them, the inventory is only the part that they like to use and they don't need the lab notebook. So OpenBIS is very customizable. So you can decide on which components you need, how much you want to use and what essentially you want to use. Um, and then the data stored in OpenBIS, they are analyzing it using PyBIS. Py, uh, so this is a Python uh, tool that one again one of our colleagues have worked on, Sven. So PyBIS is um, is uh, is their way to analyze their data. This is our use case two. Um, so I had mentioned about consulting and helping the researchers on board or sort of figure out how. Um, you know, the data will be managed, right? So this is an example of, um, of what was actually done with one of the labs in EMPA. EMPA is a material science and technology institute in, uh, in Switzerland. So the research institute um, initially uh, tested, uh, you know, had pilot uh, labs with open base testing, basically, and eventually the institute was onboarded. So now they are onboarding um, and using, and, and they have started to use open base. And but before you start to use open base, open base is just a software, right? You cannot just use the software without putting some information there. So what was done was one of my colleagues. We have these meetings. We would sit down with the researchers together and sort of figure out, you know, how best they can sort of organize the data. And this is their methods, I believe this is part of their um, inventory and here as you can see that they have specimens they have all these protocols different raw materials and so on that they you know had to, they wanted to put together and organize the data and ultimately this is sort of how it would look like you know once you have this data model planned you start to build these um, different collections this is how it will look like you know you will start to put in all these projects you have your set of measurements or a collection of raw data raw materials and so on um, another use case I wanted to mention is about BAM. So this is really under the openrdm.eu uh, program. So the BAM is the Materials uh, um, Material Sciences um, Institute in Germany. So this is a pilot. They have a pilot. Uh, they had a pilot study with five different labs initially that they started with. They have now completed it. The labs were performing different kinds of research. So this was ranging from research and monitoring on structural systems, uh, primarily bridges, to degradation of micro plastics, environmental samples like soil, air, water, um, polymers, nano, saf nano safety research, tomography, and so on. So as you can see, very um, different sort of, uh, you know, uh, areas. Um, and what uh, we did here was also initially we had different sets of uh, meetings and discussions with the with the researchers from different labs. We sat down together with them and helped them figure out how they wanted to organize the lab. So we supported them on board. There were installation questions. There were uh, um, uh, as they as they moved along, and eventually when all of this was done, they would have their uh, open this ready for the users to start using everything. Use case four is an example from Fraunhofer. Um, this is the biggest uh, non for profit research organization in Germany, and there are about 75 institutes in Fraunhofer, and there is a collective research um, going on here, and they work with crash and fracture mechanics. Um, they generate a lot of data during these tests uh, um, and um, they examine the behavior of the material. So, for example, how much stress these materials can take, how fast they break, and so on. And they wanted to use OpenBase as a data management system. So they would have a lot of data, but they would like to store OpenBase. In their cases, they wanted us to consult them again. Um, but because this is a big institute, there are a lot of people working. So what we did was it was a little different. We um, dedicated our meetings into two different sections, right? Like we had a separate consulting meeting for the data model. So more on the scientific sort of discussions in terms of 
um, how best uh, to bring in and how to organize the data structure, but also a separate set of uh, technical, the hardcore technical meetings where um, it would range from installation, uh, installation problems to um, I don't know what kind of you know um, uh, access uh, would be given, what kind of instance, if it's a multi-group, if it's a single group instance, and so on. So all kinds of questions related to any technical aspect of OpenBIS were actually discussed in separately this meeting. So this is how we are at the moment uh, progressing in this project, and we have a few other um, uh, research institutes also who we are supporting at the moment and. Um, it seems that um, OpenBase has provided them with uh, quite a bit of uh, nice support. So with that, I think I'm going to stop talking further about uh, um, uh, anything anymore. I would like to quickly acknowledge all of my colleagues that we have a huge development uh, team at the moment for OpenBase. Um, and we also have an RDM team. So Katrina, I have mentioned about these people in the beginning, Katrina, Henry, Richard, and Sergio are very involved in this project directly. Um, and we, of course, have a beautiful team of people who are constantly involved in um, troubleshooting, in assisting um, researchers from across different parts of, of Europe or outside of Europe as well, because a lot of different people are using OpenBIS at the moment. Um, even from um, from different parts of the world, actually. So with that, I would uh, bring it to an end. I would like to thank you for your patience. Uh, there's documentation and video tutorials of OpenBIS on the website openbiz.ch. Uh, there's a website, of course. We have a help desk and there's a mailing list. Um, I think I will end the slideshow quickly here. I'll just stop. So a couple of things I wanted to mention in this demo part of OpenBIS, uh, maybe it's worth mentioning that this is the website. So in Marketplace eOSC, uh, you can find the openrdm.eu um, project. And if any of you are interested or would like to further know about it, there is a web page uh, link. And if you click on this, this should bring you to the openrdm.eu. So in case you want to learn a little bit more about us or even um, ask questions, there's the email, the mailing list and so on. There's a service order form here as well. If you are interested, uh, you have the option to fill this out and we will get in touch with you. So there's the option of consulting and support or just the demo instance and or both in case you would like to try OpenBIS and um, learn a little bit more. The website also has quite, this is our website, openbiz.ch. This also had varied uh, features like, you know, we have different resources, you have the documentation, there are some, uh, you know, there's some video tutorials and so on. And there is also a demo um, uh, here. And when we click on this, it will take us to this link. And I wanted to quickly show you a couple of um, features. And we have basically seen it at the moment, but uh, makes sense to just show it to you live. Sorry, I didn't realize this was here. Okay, so um, so with OpenBase, it's pretty simple actually. It looks like it has a lot. It's not. It's just a lab notebook, the inventory, stock, utilities, and so on. So the inventory is the part that I had initially talked about. The materials and the methods section. Um, within the materials, of course, there are all these different collections that have been built. Uh, I had mentioned a little bit about it. So, for example, if I click on this chemicals collection, you will see the list of all these chemicals that have been um, put or organized as a part of the inventory for this, maybe this lab, this imaginary lab. The, these columns, uh, you can customize how much you want to see or how little you want to see. So if you don't want to actually see so much, you know, you can always basically reduce uh, and make your view more sort of uh, narrow, let's say, and then there are export options. So you can export all the columns, some columns and so on as you need to. Um, there is also the method section where the protocols are hosted. So this is a general protocols part. So as you can see all these protocols here, here. Um, let's say we click on one. What you get here, you get the general section of the protocol where you can write what protocol it is, what it is, what it is used for, and so on. And of course, you have some of this parent-child uh, option of linking these entities. So the parents are all these, um, uh, let's say, regions that actually have used in this protocol. So you can put them all in this protocol because uh, you know that you have actually used them. And 
After the inventory part, I'll quickly go to the lab notebook part. So here I mentioned everybody gets their own space. And remember, it doesn't have to be Diana Otto's. It could also be, I don't know, let's say you're working on a disease. It could be the disease name of, of the project. It doesn't have to be your private space. Here you have a project, let's say. This is your project, inducible transcription factor. And within the project, um, an individual can start to put their experiments, to put some experimental um, details here. And within the experiments, you have your experimental steps. Once you start to put some information in your experimental steps, you also have this option to do the hierarchy graph, the graph I kind of mentioned about before. So you can move this graph around and you can see all these things that you have actually used uh, during um, working on this uh, project here. So you can see all of this and you can make this bigger or smaller and so on and play around with it. And you can click on individuals and you can take it uh, to the next level. And then you have the data sets, of course, attached to your experimental um, step. Other than this, there is also a component of the utility. So this is where we have our settings and you can play around with different settings. Here, the, the Jupyter components, you can't really see it because the Jupyter Hub is not, um, I believe it's not activated in this case, but this is something you will be able to see here. You can launch your Jupyter notebooks from here. You have a barcode. Um, you know, you can also, yeah, there's different other the things to play around with in the settings. Um, and this, uh, this sort of, you know, is really helpful because this is the area where you can kind of customize what you need, sorry, versus what you don't need. Um, so I think with that, um, I will sort of come to a stop. Um, that should be uh, exactly.